All right, you're good. Good evening. I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live. Thank you for joining us in our virtual format in the midst of truly extraordinary times. We strive to continue to bring you the authors you love and the new books you crave. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase Anne Helen Peterson's Can't Even, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation on Politics and Prose's website. As a special bonus, anyone who buys a copy of Can't Even from Politics and Prose this evening before the discussion ends will be eligible to win a complimentary Capitalism is Broken sweatshirt, which we will ship to you for free. Just follow the link in the chat to place your order. We'll announce the winner before the event is over tonight. If you have a question for Anne or our panel, you can use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the screen. We will try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of our discussion. Apologies in advance if we don't have time to address yours this evening. Before we begin, we want to sincerely thank you for being with us this evening. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Anne Helen Peterson is a senior culture writer for BuzzFeed News and creator of Substack.com's Culture Study Newsletter. She has authored a number of articles and books that capture the zeitgeist of our times, including Too Fat, Too Slutty, Too Loud, The Rise and Reign of the Unruly Woman, Scandals of Classic Hollywood, and more. Joining Anne are panelists Hamed Aliaziz, Jordan Bennett Begay, Ashley Lopez, and Soraya Nadia McDonald. In her latest work, Peterson examines the history and phenomenon of burnout culture through a variety of lenses. Navigating failed institutions, unrealistic expectations of the modern workplace, and the performance anxiety of virtual reality can even challenge readers to consider the cultural shifts that got us here, the forces that fuel and sustain our burnout, and the urgent need for change. Please join me in welcoming Anne Helen Peterson to PNP Live. Hi, I am so happy to be here with everyone. Um, this is totally surreal. I did my hair for the first time in months. Um, I put on eyeliner, but it makes uh, this feel like the monumental day that it is to me, which is a pub day. It really feels like um, I'm just very excited to have the book out in the world. And I am more excited to have this conversation with these journalists that I admire so much. So one of the chapters in the book is about basically how the internet makes everything work. It makes our social lives work. It makes, um, you know, just being in the world work in so many different ways. And I mean work as in labor. And then there's a whole section of it that's really about what the news cycle has become and the exhaustion that accompanies it. And so I wanted to bring some journalists here today, especially because this is politics and prose, um, to talk about both the exhaustion of the news cycle pre and post COVID. And then also to talk about what as journalists we can do to try to decrease some of that burnout from the news cycle and uh, how it can benefit our readers and just thinking broadly. So I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves and they are gonna tell you one article that they feel is exemplary of their work or that they're really proud of so that you can find their work online and, and follow them. And then they're also going to talk about an organization that's important to them and that I'm donating $250 to each of these organizations as a, a gesture of thanks and just to, to make this feel like something uh, that is doing something bigger than, you know, just a Zoom event. Um, and we're gonna have information about those organizations that I think is gonna be either in the side panel or beneath the YouTube screen. And so you can find and chip in even just $2, $5, whatever you're able, it's really meaningful. Um, so I'm gonna throw first to Hamed. So I'm Hamed Ali Aziz. Uh, I cover immigration for BuzzFeed News. Uh, I'm Anne's former colleague. Uh, and uh, one story that uh, I wanted to highlight is a story I wrote in April about uh, ICE moving uh, dozens of detainees uh, across the country uh, between facilities, between jails, and how that uh, sparked uh, an outbreak in, uh, in one of the facilities in Texas. 
uh, a really important topic. Um, and as far as the organization that I'm, uh, you know, uh, and is so, uh, you know, uh, I'm so glad that she's donating to is a committee to protect journalists, which uh, defends the right of journalists uh, to report the news safely uh, without fear of reprisal. Uh, and they track this uh, across the, the globe. All right, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Hi, yat esh a Jordan Bennett Begay and she kia ani and she my excuse me about she was a touchy need a Chanel. Um, and I am Jordan Bennett Begay. I am Dene Navajo. Um, I am the deputy managing editor for Indian Country Today. Um, right now I'm bouncing all over the country. <laughs> um, but I'm based in Washington, D.C. And uh, I guess my organization that I chose was the Native American Journalists Association. Um, they uh, exist to empower indigenous voices through journalism and through um, different actions and programs. And so they can, you know, so there's accurate uh, portrayal of uh, native people or indigenous people and their cultures. Um, and one story I think I'm proud of is one I did in April and it's called Behind Those COVID-19 Numbers. Um, and that really explores, um, you know, what's the story behind the data, uh, especially Indian country, because there's a lack of data and um, what those really mean. Yeah. Ashley. Hey, I'm Ashley Lopez. Um, I'm a reporter in Austin, Texas. I work for KUT as the NPR station here we cover. We cover the state because we are in the capital. So I'm a politics reporter. So I sometimes cover um, state politics, but also healthcare because you know politics isn't enough, I guess. Um, <laughs> and also the two intersect a lot. So um, I end up doing just a lot of like healthcare stories. Abortion comes up a lot, for example. Um, and I guess since I do a lot of local stuff, I'll point you to maybe the last national story I did was about um, election officials, uh, particularly in Texas, uh, finding creative ways to do in-person voting when being around other people is really dangerous. Like people are coming up with like drive-through options, stuff like that. I thought it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm supporting Latinitas. That's uh, a local group in Austin that provides, um, like it teaches like little girls, little Hispanic girls about media and technology. And they have like a little magazine, it's super cute. So if you are interested at all, uh, they're a great organization. Awesome. Soraya. <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me. Hello. Um, my name is Soraya Nadia McDonald. I am the culture critic for The Undefeated. Uh, we are a site um, owned by ESPN that covers race, sports, and culture. Um, my piece that I would like to share um, is my episode six review of Watchmen, um, This Extraordinary Being. Um, since it recently won several Emmys. <laughs> not, not the piece, but the show. Um, <laughs> um, which I, but I'm, I'm just, I'm still excited uh, for them and their accomplishment. Um, the organization that I am supporting is the Sports Journalism Institute, uh, which gave me like one of my first opportunities um, to intern at a daily newspaper uh, back when I was still covering sports. Awesome. So the first question, and this is gonna require us to really, I think, do some imaginative thinking is what was exhausting about the news cycle pre-COVID? So you have to kind of go back in time to imagine you're like, I don't know, January self or pre-January self and about specifically about your beat and what you're covering and, and what was really difficult um, to keep up with, um, but also to feel uh, like you were serving your readers, also serving your editors, you know, just keeping pace. So let's go backwards this time. So let's do Soraya first. Okay. Um, you know, honestly, uh, if we're going to talk about sort of like what my life <laughs> and my work life in particular was like before uh, the pandemic, um, I kind of, I don't really know how I was keeping up the schedule that I had, <laughs> um, to be honest, yeah. uh, because, you know, a, about, you know, a third, if not more, um, to my work day was spent at the theater um, because you know mostly I write about I write about um, 
film and television and sometimes art and books, um, but chiefly I write about theater, um, which means, you know, I live in Brooklyn. Um, so I was going into Midtown Manhattan roughly like five to six times a week. Um, but then it like in addition, on top of that, like still, you know, getting up at like 8 a.m. And, and kind of working a regular work day and then leaving around, I guess, six-ish. Yeah, for curtain times. Um, I definitely, you know, as I was reading your book, Anne, <laughs> uh, I, I sort of recognized myself uh, when you were kind of, when you were laying out the difference between burnout and exhaustion. Because mm-hmm. um, there was definitely a moment last year, like in the middle of the year, actually, it was, I want to say at the end of June. Um, so it's after the Tonys. Uh, Cause that's usually like, by the time I start to get like really sort of run down, I'm just like, I just gotta make it through the townies. Um, <laughs> and I realized that I was so tired um, that I actually, I just needed to sort of like pull an emergency break and take a week off. Uh, and I had a vacation coming like at the, like I think the week or the week after that. Uh, in July, and I just could not. I was like, I I just can't do anymore. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think like all of us really, we're just doing so much more travel and and scheduling. Like our schedules are just so much more frantic. And I I was traveling like every other week for a story or for to go speak at a school or something like that, or go to the the BuzzFeed offices in New York. How was I doing that? I really like it feels very foreign now. Um, And and I feel like I do have some perspective on it. Ashley. Yeah, I mean, I have a similar situation in that, like in radio, you really have to get in a person's face in order to get good audio. So I'm surprised like how actually it's fine that I don't always have like some room sound for everything, Uh, (laughs) but I'll go back to that because it is the right thing to do. Um, But you know, Texas is an interesting place to be a reporter. I'm from Florida, so I feel like I have to be a political reporter in big important states with a lot of things broken. Um, And so I kind of realized at one point, like before even COVID hit, how many times I was talking about the same stuff being broken all the time? Like how many stories can I write about Texas having the highest uninsured rate? And it's just being such a bummer and like having to talk to the same people about not having insurance. And I don't know, it's just like, I think that was kind of wearing me out. And then, you know, and then a lot of voting stuff here, like moving into an election in 2020 and like Texas doesn't have online voter registration, like just basic 21st century stuff. And I mean, we can talk, I mean, this is like more looking forward, but like, you know, all this work that I was finding kind of annoying and repetitive, just kind of like blew up in this year. But even before then I found like my job, you know, I don't know that it's helpful to everyone that, you know, to mention the same things over and over again that aren't working. Cause I think that probably makes voters feel a little powerless and maybe me too. Um, but yeah, I think like that's what I was mostly feeling coming into COVID which is just like how many versions of the same story am I gonna be telling for the rest of my career? You're like, oh, checking back in, Medicaid still has not been expanded in Texas. <laughs> you know, like that's not, it's not a change. Yeah, and then like trying to remind myself that like you know, I mean, the worst part is that you have to, not the worst part, but it's like the important part of the job is that you have to talk to people who are affected by these things. And that does create, like, I don't know if that's emotional exhaustion, but it kind of does create like that situation where you're just like, man, I I have to empathize so much in my job. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of crazy how much we have to do that as reporters sometimes that I, I like, I sometimes feel myself being like, either I have to get numb to this or just get real used to being sad all the time. Right, right. And also like feeling kind of weird when you do feel numb, right? You're like, why am I not feeling anything right now? And it's because you're like, your mind has built up a little bit of a defense mechanism, but it can feel very alienating. Yeah. And um, Jordan. Um, I think, I was trying to think of like what, I think it felt a little bit slower to me Mm -hmm. right now because I think um and now I think I don't have to plan like going to the hill all the time or even trying to figure out I I feel like now I just my skin I have to crunch everything together all to fit it all in one day because so much is happening Mm -hmm. um but pre-pandemic I think 
we didn't really actually we expanded um so we had more people on staff <laughs> and we kind of like started a newscast during the pandemic so we created more work for ourselves which is great but you know we have to keep people informed um and i think i don't know i think at one point like i know like maybe the fall this time last year i kind of felt burned out because it was one story after the other and it was kind of my editor and i um, cause at the time I was the Washington editor and managed the Washington bureau with one reporter and pretty much the other reporters around the country. Um, but we didn't have as many reporters back then. So I felt like I had to like prioritize and just kind of like tell people, no, sorry, <laughs> or there's another way we could do that to like save time on our end. Um, I don't know. I feel like, like you said, I think it's kind of foreign now. Like I never know that life anymore. I don't, I'm like, I feel like this is a life. It's, it's funny how we are as humans, we're able to adapt. And now I'm like, I feel like that was 10 years ago. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to like, you know, recall what it was like. And, um, but I know I did, again, I still worked late hours, but I think there was more of um, me setting boundaries or, you know, and the commute being the boundary, right? I could go to yep. work and now I know to work. I know the focus yep. and I could go back home and I know no more work, but now it all blends together. Um, yeah. So I think I now just dealing with it a different way. How am I going to deal with that burnout and create boundaries for myself? So I, know it's, I was trying to think about this question the whole time, you know, the other panelists <laughs> are talking. So. Yeah. No, the boundaries is so huge. And like, you know, I had been working from home since 2017 when I moved to Montana. And that was the thing that I missed the most was having that commute as a kind of like this buffer zone of your life. Like whether you're commuting in your car, whether you're walking 10 minutes or whatever, like I it just made it so easy. And I know a lot of people are feeling this in the pandemic to just roll over and start working immediately. You're like, my phone's right here go through my emails. What can I like get out of the way right now to facilitate the rest of my day? And that's so unhealthy to have no buffer zone, no decompression zone from, from work to home in that way. Exactly. Well, and also just like feeling the guilt too, of not responding right. to those emails or saying right. no to somebody. I'm like, I feel so guilty, but <laughs> you have to protect yourself and your energy too. So yes. It's a hard lesson. <laughs> Hamid. Well, I think uh, when it comes to immigration, um, it's felt like a sprint since the the, the beginning of, uh, you know, when President Trump took over the first week, uh, this unprecedented Muslim ban of mm -hmm. uh, all these, uh, you know, countries in the Middle East, chaos in the airports. And ever since then, I feel like every single week there is some policy, something they're trying to overhaul uh, when it comes to legal and illegal immigration. So for me, it's just like, it's been exhausting trying to, to keep, uh, you know, track of that, uh, keep ahead of it, trying to find uh, sources within the government to, you know, tell me uh, things that the government doesn't want me to know. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, trying to get people to care through human stories, you know, the, the policies and how they reflect on the ground at the border uh, and within the, the U.S. So... Uh, for me, it was just, uh, and it still is really just nonstop, um, you know, trying to, to keep track of everything and get people to care. How did you, and this is a question that kind of, I think, links to some of the things we're going to talk about later, but how did you figure out how to discern or how to deal with the fact that this administration oftentimes throws like executive orders or like various ideas and tweets out so often that can't be enacted, but that you have to somehow cover? Like, how did you figure out, maybe working with your editors, how to, how to grapple with that? Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff is just rhetorical and trying to, uh, you know, the, the president has, has found that immigration is his key uh, yeah. campaign issue. And so some of the things you just know through practice uh, can't be enforced. Uh, you know, we, we you know, will note them, but maybe not, you know, uh, dedicate so much time uh, and I think that comes with conversations with editors, but also with your source base and people informing you like, wow, this isn't really a thing. So we're going to cycle backwards again. I don't know. I like this style, but um, how, how post COVID, and this can be about your beat, but also just about how your life as a reporter has changed and, and stresses that have made it more difficult, like either as a parent or um, being distant from family or being worried about family, all that sort of thing. So how post-COVID has the news cycle started to, to change and your job change as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, the administration is still doing, uh, you know, uh, crazy immigration policies, uh, you know, every single week, like I said before. Yeah. Now there's a COVID element of, you know, trying to, to understand what's going on in these detention centers, these ICE detention centers, trying to, you know, really um, cover it and, and make sure that people understand what's going on with, with folks in custody and how people are dying in custody due to COVID. Um, personally, you know, I was already working from home. I'm in Sonoma County uh, before uh, before this the pandemic, but at least I was able to go to the office in San Francisco. I was going to DC like every eight weeks, and that was really helpful just to, to see people in person. Um, and I really, really miss that. Uh, and, and you know, I get to see my my kid uh, every day and, and constantly with my two year old, which is which is fantastic. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been challenging. Uh, did the smoke, like, I know for me last week was really, really hard. Just like, I was so cranky because of the smoke, like that was still here. I'm in Washington state right now and just like suffocating. Did you feel that at all? Like it did make it just harder to like go to work every day and just like, yeah. oh, just awful because, you know, I would always, uh, take a walk during, uh, you know, during the pandemic, go for coffee. And uh, especially some of these stressful stories where I have the government yelling at me, I like to work out right afterward, go for like a long <laughs> run. I can't even do that. I'm just like trapped. I'm just like, what do I, what do I do? So I guess I, yeah, just trying to figure out different ways to, to relieve stress. Yeah, that was my, like my, it was like my one release valve, my one pandemic release valve, the outdoors has been taken from me. Um, so it was a real struggle, but um, Ashley. Well, the thing like now in COVID times, it's just like every problem that I was ever reported on, they just added some water and it grew. Um, <laughs> so, and then some are self-inflicted. Like I think the day that the state shut down, they also uh, banned abortion outright. And so a lot of my job was just like following court orders, talking to abortion providers as like, like frantic women were like, you know, having meltdowns. It's just, it was like everything all at once was happening. And, you know, and then it was like, you, I'm personally scared. Like I, you know, I'm a public health reporter. Like I always saw a pandemic coming. Like I was mentally prepared for this, but not really, right? Like I, I'm like, I thought it was gonna be so much worse. I've watched, I mean, even before like the pandemic, I watched Contagion like maybe 30 times in my life. So like, I already knew every worst case scenario. So it was like, I'm trying to do my job. I'm a, like a future, like I'm a planner and I'm like the ability to not plan in advance, especially when it comes to reporting, like bigger projects take like a lot of future planning. Like that really felt like, yeah, the ability not to do that, especially when something's big, you want to be able to plan and like COVID's big and like this upcoming election is big. And yeah, like I wasn't able, I haven't been able to do a lot of that and everything feels like it's kind of being thrown together last minute, which is like not my style. It's not how I thrive. Um, so COVID's just been interesting in like me trying to regulate my own emotions and expectations of what's going to happen. Um, take away a big part of how I live my life, which is like planning. Um, and then like, you know, a, I think like people like to, I, I don't know, I, I feel like it doesn't make my reporting sound all that good when everything is just sort of fragmented because I can't be in a scene and see what's going on and people are already distrustful and scared. Mm -hmm. So especially when you're like a local station, you're kind of like the front lines a lot, like people go to your website just to find out what's open and stuff. And so- yep having like the same press releases they do and that's about it because every like all public officials are freaking out too it's just so many things i could do this i could do like a whole set about this but um <laughs> i think like what i'm like most finding is that now that i've been we've been doing this for what six months like it's crazy how much i've adapted to this mm -hmm. and how much i mean and i will get into this later but like how much i'm just like no nah, like that's not i'm not gonna invest emotional and, and mental time mm -hmm. into that um, because early on it was really hard because I felt like I had to do everything mm -hmm. and yeah so that was so I would like break down over weird things like the fact that I had to buy a desk for my apartment made me really mad because <laughs> it was just like I felt like here it is like the permanence of this um, so yeah it's just been like a balance of like doing good trying to do good work and like managing my own like roller coaster of emotions.
I, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, journalists and non-journalists really get that, understand that feeling of like, not want in the past trying to manage the long term projects like you know flex that muscle and the short term projects at once like trying to keep all both of those balls in the air and and maybe doing an okay job of it and what covid and i think to some extent this administration has done is made it so hard to do that because anytime you feel like okay i'm going to concentrate on the big thing then one of those small balls comes at you and you have to grapple with it and oftentimes I think like short-term stuff can be very gratifying and important, so important. But then at the same time, these longer term things often feel a little bit more cathartic and a little bit more um, long-term meaningful. And there's just not as much emotional or psychological space for them. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes that can be stressful is just like short-term stuff doesn't feel like you own it as much, but like the yep. long-term stuff, it feels like a real, like you really put your heart into it. And that makes work sometimes just feel more satisfying and not being able to do a lot of that. You feel kind of like untethered a little bit, which is kind of what <laughs> I, I hear yeah. a lot of. Well, and I'm so glad that I finished this book right before the pandemic started. Like I, I finished, like the copy editing was happy, happening in January. And that's why there's only that like very brief forward in the book that's about kind of gesturing towards COVID and what's happening. Because I think, you know, I've heard from a lot of writers who tried to write their books during COVID and there's just so much distraction, so much fear, so much anxiety that it makes it really hard to sit down and concentrate on those longer term projects, whatever they might be. Um, Jordan. Um, so, I mean, I guess since we cover, I feel like we don't really have beats at Indian country today. We've been trying to establish them, but they got everything uh, it kind of overlaps and affects one another. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to tell people, oh, my beats Indian country or Native American, Alaska Native communities. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, I think it's what, what made it really hard was uh, our communities are very, or, uh, a very community oriented. We like to gather, we like to talk, we like to visit, you know, like any other human being. Um, but that's one of the central like values and commonalities in a lot of um, the indigenous cultures. And, but now that we can, and that's where reporters, that's where at least I built my sources. That's where I built my relationships. Mm -hmm. I could go to the Hill and, you know, talk to people, just talk to people and see what stories are going on. Um, again, building those relationships, but now that it's on a screen or on social media or on a phone call, it's kind of hard to like build that type of rapport with them. Although you're still building it, but it's a different type. It's very distant. And I feel like to be disingenuous. Um, and now you can't, you know, uh, you know, go to a community event, I don't know, for the census and really get, you know, down and dirty to like, and get to the, you know, nuts and bolts of what's going on. And like uh, Ashley was saying, you can't really see what's happening there too. Mm -hmm. um, and it does. And so we have to like get creative in how we tell a story and like really talking the sources um, and just <laughs> stalking people on social media more or like, you know, bugging them more saying, we need to talk to you. <laughs> um, and I think now we definitely figured out a way to do that. Again, we also um, built a newscast out of it to kind of um, inform our communities of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and we also built a relationship with a lot of tribal radio stations because that's also a big form of communication within mm -hmm. um, tribes. Um, so it's just trying to get more creative and innovative um, on that part and trying to you know, keep them informed. Um, we also grew during this time too. So I think now that we were overwhelmed with stories and we were able to do more stories, but as always we're saying, we need more native writers. <laughs> we need more people to tell these stories. Cause again, it's prioritizing and figuring out, you know, if Trump refers to um, Senator Elizabeth Warren as Pocahontas, is it some, every single time on our 10 tweets? Like, is it something worth covering? Right. Is it something worth right. like a tidbit in there? And there's one point where we just, yeah, we had to make a decision where we just like throw it in a story and just don't give any attention to it um, because it kept getting repeated over and over within a week. It, it was really exhausting. <laughs> um, was, it, was it exhausting too to, you know, there was so, there was a fair amount of national media coverage like on Navajo Nation because of the outbreak there and just watching, because I know a lot, some of it was good and some of it was not so good. And I know like as a member of, of Naja, like you guys are always watching 
and trying to help different organizations do better in their coverage of Indian country. And so, but to layer that on, like you're trying to do your own work, but then also like read all of this national coverage too. Is that like an extra source of exhaustion? <laughs> It is, oh, it is, and I think like even if we're yeah, not members of Nodgers and not on the board, we're always trying to like, keep them in check, and it, it does get exhausting at times. And pretty soon, <laughs> I just want to come to a point where I'm like, I don't want to give any attention to mainstream media because I, it, it takes away time from my community, and you know they ignored us for a long time, so I can ignore you for a while. <laughs> um, but also, it's like also you kind of feel responsible as well. Like, you know, like who else is going to teach them? Who else is going to? I mean, there's this whole national organization, and Dave's gone to like the New York Times newsroom and talked to them, and still they're not doing a great job. Mm -hmm. um, so it is. It's I, I don't know like how we balance it, but I think it's just you kind of have to figure out like is this already preaching to the choir type deal, or is it something? Um, you're speaking to a new issue in a new way um, and you just kind of have to pick your battles um, at that because I know they kept saying uh, Navajo Nation did have one of the highest infection rates and although that is true a lot of the Pueblos had higher infection rates than in Navajo Nation as well as other tribals, um, tribal nations but I don't think a lot of people knew that um, mm -hmm. just because Navajo is a huge tribe and we're very um, a tribe's very generous <laughs> with our knowledge and sharing. So I yep. think that's why a lot of the focus went to them. Yep. Yep. And I, you know, it's just the outbreaks that have like gone through my home state in Montana to, to each reservation. And like, you don't see that same attention. Like it was like, oh, this is a play early on in the coverage. Let's focus on this. And it's, you know, because it's a, almost a sensational story in some ways. And you don't see that sustained coverage of other communities, other reservations, other tribes that are affected as much. Yeah, well, it speaks to like the lack of education system, the American education system isn't that great, you know, um, a lot of them don't teach, you know, indigenous or native history in their states, and some states if they don't have um, a large native population there, or maybe like uh, any reservations, they assume people, native people are non-existent, but there's native people living there, you yeah. know, they um, have a stake in whatever, um, you know, issues are playing out um, at the state level or local level too. Um, well, and it's just like, it's just not, it's just very ignorant, honestly. Like you have the Mississippi Choctaw um, Indians in Mississippi who had a huge um, spike in cases. You had Wind River in uh, Wyoming had a spike in cases. A lot of Montana tribes, a lot of North and South Dakota tribes up in Wisconsin also. And I think it's just educating themselves on this. Maybe that's what people can do with the extra time is just read. <laughs> read. <laughs> Soraya, what's changed for you post-COVID? Um, I would say the biggest thing is just I my resentment of screens. <laughs> yeah. Um, because that's that is now how I consume everything, right? It's how we communicate with people. It's uh, you know, how I, you know, get my sort of like dose, you know, it's how I do basically my entire job now, um, because there is no theater. Um, and I don't think, you know, as I'm, as I'm thinking about this and, and what I said initially about like how I don't know how my life before was sustainable. I realized that like part of that is because like, being in community, like in a room with other people um, and, and sort of going through the emotional arcs of a play or a musical, like feeds the soul, it gives you energy, you know? Um, when you hear someone sort of like laughing behind you at like the same thing you're laughing at, or, you know, you can hear someone sniffling in the dark because they're like really touched by something. Um, and so particularly for me, because I live by myself, it's just me and my cat. Um, you know, I think I told somebody earlier this week, like New York is my family. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I go out to, to be with people and to feel like a human. Um, and so not being able to do that, like has definitely had an effect on my depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely like after consulting with my therapist, I upped my um, 
my dosage on my depression meds. Um, you know, the other thing I think is just, um, I've had like this overwhelming feeling of guilt um, because like relatively speaking, I'm, I'm doing okay, you know, I can support myself. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, earlier in the spring, um, there were all these colleagues around me who were, you know, taking pay cuts or like doing whatever they could just to, so their colleagues could keep working. Um, and I, it's, it's messed with me, um, you know? <laughs> uh, and it's weird because like, like professionally, this is probably like the best year I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels kind of crappy because I'm like, well, I can't celebrate it with anybody. And also like there are people who are just really bad off um, and it just doesn't feel right. Um, you know, I think the other thing that I am like very conscious of um, and I feel like I'm sort of asking myself before I uh, review anything um, is uh, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like, okay, are we all sort of like being a little too generous because we're kind of grading on a curve because everyone feels crappy. And then like the further you get into it, it's like, oh, am I being too mean because I just have like asshole pandemic brain? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, you know, so I'm, I, you know, I will say to my editor, I'm like, okay, you have to be the guardrails to make sure that I'm not just being obnoxious. Um, you know, if I pan something, uh, because, you know, I'm trying to be aware of the sort of like situation that I'm in mentally, physically, you know, whatever. Um, and I want to be fair to artists and I want to be fair to their work. Um, you know, the other thing I realized, like we've had like two film, two major film festivals, right? Toronto and New York happen like all online. And again, like I just come back to, oh dear God, like I never wanna, I just don't wanna look at another screen. <laughs> <laughs> right, like not a personal screen. And this is, you know, I think when we were talking about the commute, one of the ways that I think people manage burnout is by consciously or unconsciously creating these buffers in their lives. And a big one for me was going to the movies because I couldn't look at my screen for two hours. And I had that real feeling of immersion and distance and not thinking about work, right? Even if I was watching it to like write about it eventually, I still like wasn't directly thinking about work necessarily. It, it felt so amazing <laughs> and that feel like the time when we can go to the theater or go to a movie again safely like at least that I feel safe doing it feels like a really long time from now um and what that does is it makes it so that you feel like okay well if I'm watching on the tv like I am gonna maybe like give in to my my worst or most tired self and like start scroll scrolling through my phone, even though I don't want to, right? But there's just no thing that holds you from it. Oh, absolutely. And I think in particular, like in the way this sort of applies to pop culture, because it's not just me, um, is that there's been this uptick of people like watching shows that they've are, they already know, right? They've already watched, particularly folks with anxiety disorders, because they don't, they don't actually want to have to sort of like anticipate, you know, big shifts or or try to like see around plot corners. Like they just want to feel sort of comfortable, uh, which I totally understand. Like my sort of safe space, you know, for that is I have started basically like rewatching old masterpiece PBS series and Bob's Burgers. Like those are my two, oh, and Girlfriends now because it's on Netflix. Like those are basically my three sort of like comfort watches. Like earlier in the pandemic, when I felt like I could still, you know, when I had an attention span and I could still appreciate things, you know, I went back and rewatched Mad Men and I felt so proud of myself because I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm still finding new things to appreciate about this show. And now I'm just like, oh. 
<laughs> I cannot tell you how many episodes of Law and Order SVU I have watched. Um, that show has problems. It's copaganda. Like there, there's really good writing on its problems, but it is exactly what you say it is, which is that like even though sometimes the show throws you a curveball, it is a classic melodrama in a lot of ways, and I feel like it is pretty morally legible in a way that feels very comforting. Um, and I resent that I don't feel psychologically capable to grapple with some of these more sophisticated shows that I really want to watch. Right. And that that's a struggle, right? When there's something in front of you that you know, you want, you know, you want to do it, <laughs> but you can't bring yourself to do it. To me, that's a, a real symptom of burnout too. pandemic burnout, just general burnout. <laughs> oh, yes. I was gonna say I started rewatching Grey's Anatomy again. <laughs> you are not the only person. I Sam Sanders has been rewatching it. I uh, was a, a person for NPR, and he, like, that has been a great joy for me to watch him going through it. But that's like a perfect example of a show that you're like, I know what's going to happen. Like this is very clear. It is a real comfort. Um. Okay. So we have like. A little bit of time before we're going to go to questions. So this is, I, we're going to do it like fire, like what do they call it? Like fast round. But the, I'm going to ask you to solve all the problems of journalism in like two minute answers. So please don't, this is, this is you know, a low bar. Um, but basically, if there's anything that you've thought of that you are trying to institute in your life or in your newsroom, that tries to alleviate, or you think would work to help alleviate not only journalists burnout in this moment and moving forward, um, cause like, it's not gonna get better on election day. Like the political news cycle is just gonna get worse. Um, but also for readers, cause right, these are the people who are tuned in right now or most of them, some of them are journalists, some of them are readers. How do we try to overall make this news cycle less of what it is and less of a burnout cycle? So. Does anyone have, I, I'm not gonna throw it to Soraya necessarily. Does anyone, has anyone can go for this answer? Well, well that's okay, I have ideas. Okay, go, <laughs> go. Um, I mean, and what's really worrisome is that uh, it's, it's the exact opposite basically of what news organizations have been doing because of money, which is we need more bodies, <laughs> right? Like you basically, <clears throat> rather than sort of you know, this idea that like journalists are like doctors and we're always on call, um, you know, when some shit breaks, uh, in order to have boundaries, like you gotta have, you know, you have to have the people that basically enable you to have boundaries, right? Like you, you need to have those folks who can be sort of like the weekend person and the night person and the nine to five person. And like back when newsrooms actually had money, like those positions existed. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that has been really difficult and has basically sort of shaped journalism for the past, gee, I don't know, 14, 15 years, you know, has been sort of like this steady decline in revenue and staffers, right? Um, the other thing I would say is that like, not only do we need like just more people um, to cover these things so that everyone can actually live a full and human life because like, you know, like I know how I feel and you know, I just have to keep my cat alive. Like there are people <laughs> who have like families and small children and husbands and wives who I'm sure like love them and want them to be present with them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, that's, that's not a bad thing. Like we have, <laughs> I think this, this attitude, you know, of sort of like tremendous self-sacrifice and that is the only way for us to be good journalists. And it's usually tremendous self-sacrifice paired with really shitty pay. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, I think the thing that it, that actually helps us be better journalists and better citizens is when, you know, we have time to decompress, when we can go swimming or running or whatever it is that we need to do after work, when we can spend time and like put our kids to bed and do all of those things, um, you know, because your brain eventually, you can't just go, go, go all the time. It's just, it's just not gonna work. 
Um, and then the other thing I would say, in addition to we need more people is like more of those people need to be black, they need to be indigenous, they need to be, you know, people of color across the spectrum, they need to be queer, they need to be trans, like, like all of the people, right, we need to embrace into the fold uh, of this profession. Um, because there are so many stories uh, to tell, and there's so many ways to tell them. Um, and we want our readers to trust us. And we want to be able to tell those stories with authority. So my thought actually dovetails like right off of what Soraya is saying. So I think we need more people in different places. Um, I'm a local reporter. So I think like I, I'm actually pretty privileged in that I get to do the thing that I think actually helps with news burnout. I think people have a national news burnout. Mm -hmm. It's like the kind of news that you have very little direct effect on. Um, it's so abstract to you and it's the most toxic probably like depending where you live, right? It could be the most toxic form of your government that you experience every day. So I think like, you know, having more local news um, can be really therapeutic for people because like, I mean, just if you're thinking of like, you know, the BLM and, and um, the protests that have been happening, you know, in Austin, like, I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but you know, the protesters got a big ask. They got, you know, the city to move money around from, from the police department. And, you know, think of how rare that is in like national politics. So I think like part of like news burnout is seeing so little change so little having so little effect on what can be done um and then also just having it so far removed from me so i think like actually having more state and local news is could be helpful for and I, again this is coming from like a very selfish place because this is what i do but i actually think it's helpful like if we would just to have the same trend that sorry i was talking about you know it's not just that we have fewer people we have fewer people in fewer places and anyways i think that could be a big help but again who knows like well how that like how that could even be changed right yeah, more money, right? <laughs> it's interesting that all of us are, are um, writing for, like all of you are writing for places that don't have paywalls, right? So you're kind of expecting like you're working on this ad and grant funded um, model that is really dependent on a lot of things, right? Like it's not one that is always, uh, that it can expand and, and detract with the economy, which doesn't feel very stable. Um, who else has some, some ideas, comment? Do you yeah, I think, like, for me, I found that staying off Twitter uh, in the evenings and on uh, weekends is really helpful because, uh, you know, I do think, you know, if you're a beat reporter, um, you know, you need to be on there just to see what's going on during the day. But, you, you know, staying on all the time, you, you just get kind of wrapped up in that. And I think it's important to decompress, like Sarai was saying, you know, going for walks, trying to think, uh, you know, more broadly about what you're covering, what's important, what's not important, uh, and what moves you. And I feel like when you're so just like, you know, uh, you know, just reading Twitter every single moment of the, of the day, you, you're just not able to do that. So I think that's really important for journalists. I, I found I've thought of stories just on a walk to, to get coffee or walk to nowhere uh, that turn out really great. So. Jordan. Yeah, I just think for me, I think you guys kind of summed up what I was gonna say. <laughs> well, creating boundaries too, I definitely one of them, at least what I learned, um, what I was gonna try to implement was on our Slack channel saying I'm available from here to here and you can't contact me out of that. <laughs> Sorry, but I gotta, you know, um, I only have so much energy. And also just to um, put, I guess, breaks into my calendar to let me know, remind me when to eat, when to go out for a walk, <laughs> when to, you know, take care. Cause if it's on my calendar, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> and sometimes I forget <laughs> to eat, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you do too. You forget to like, oh yeah, what time is it? Five o'clock, oh, I didn't eat lunch. Maybe I'll eat my lunch or lunch right now. I don't know, <laughs> whatever you call it, right? Um, I think yoga would definitely help me in the morning when I feel very anxious and just kind of out of control. Like it really helped me ground myself and just kind of, I, I feel out of sync when I don't do it, which has been me recently. And I feel funny. I just feel like something's off. So when I don't do it, um, 
yeah, it just fell off and I need to do it more. Exercise was kind of like running or weightlifting was kind of difficult in the beginning. What was fine in the beginning, but it became more difficult as I think I kind of subconsciously knew this was going to be lasting longer than all of us thought it would be. Like I thought, oh, maybe like six months, a year. And then finally I was like, nope, it's, and then my, you know, my whole like activity <laughs> plan just kind of went out the window and I was just like, you know, it's going to be wine every night, <laughs> which also is <isn't> healthy, right? <laughs> um, so today go, was, no, um, so today I went, went on WNYC, like on a program to do talk about burnout and, you know, I was waiting on the line for them to like read the news and they had a minute of meditation where they had a woman who came on and just led a minute of meditation, like right at, it was like 2 p.m. Eastern. And like, I, I knew it was, and I just stopped everything that I was doing. And she was like, close your eyes, relax your jaw, like, like take this dip, big, deep breath. It was such a revelation. Like, I just need to listen to WNYC every day at 2 PM so that I have this minute long revelation, like moment. And I think oftentimes things like that are really positioned um, like meditation, especially, I remember seeing so many like tech bros who are like, if I meditate in the morning, then I'm more productive. And I just want to be like, it does, I'm not doing this to be more productive. I just want to be present in my life, in my body for a minute. Um, the other thing, sorry, I did, <laughs> this is a piece of swag for the book. This is a little planner that says this won't fix your burnout. Um, and I love that you said that like, you can put this in your, in your calendar and it's a good reminder, but like, all of these things, they work so well on kind of like a, a personal level and, but they only can go so far. We're like, you know, it needs to change. We need to have like a completely different funding model for journalism. <laughs> um, and I do think that, you know, I keep saying that like, we're in this, what I think of as a plastic hour, like we're in this moment of potential, like historians call it a plastic hour where you can really have huge changes, um, but we have to be willing to like, do those huge changes to like take a risk on these huge changes instead of just incremental changes. So that's where my hope is coming from, but also a lot of my anger. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a quick couple of Q and A's. The first Q and A is a really straightforward one and it's asking who is one writer on the internet who you really admire and that people should check out? I'll go. Um, so I will say uh, Roxana Haddadi, who writes for Pajiba. Um, like, I just think she's amazing. Um, like, I'm trying to come up with names that like, that aren't sort of like the, the one, you know, the same 10 that get regurgitated all the time. Um, <laughs> Robert, Robert Daniels is another uh, film critic who I think is just like, really, really smart. Um, I Taylor started following Crumpton, him recently. He's so good. He's so good. Taylor Crumpton, who writes about um, music generally, especially Southern hip hop. Um, she's from Texas, but you know, and she lives in the Bay Area. Um, and she's just like, I did. Oh, I did an episode of Pop Culture Happy with our Happy Hour with her, and she is just like blazingly smart, like just off the charts. Um, so those would be my three. Yeah. Who else? Other people have ideas for a person, on any writer on the internet that you think people should check out their work. Well, I just think uh, for me, uh, thinking on my beat, thinking the reporters that uh, uh, I'm thinking, you know, what are they working on? Uh, for me, it's uh, Caitlin Dickerson at the New York Times. She has really good work and, uh, you know, kind of a mix of uh, the human impact while also digging in deep in the government and finding out, you know, scandalous uh, situations. So yeah, she's great. Yeah. Who else? Um, I have a few. Uh, I was trying to think of like, I don't know. I just got stumped for a second. <laughs> one is, uh, and they're all indigenous journalists. Um, one's Mary Hewitt. She's at the Seattle Times. Um, she was at the AP before. She has really great work. Uh, Polly Denekla, she was at the Navajo Times. Now she's at the Texas Observer. Um, it was The third one was uh, Nick Martin. He's at the New Republic. And um, the last one was Julian Brave Noise Cat. I just admire all of their work and they do a really great job. Yeah. I'm gonna pick just two Austin ladies that I really like. Um, Alexa Ura at the Texas Tribune is um, a really amazing 
journalist if you want to understand what's going on with like voting issues in Texas. Um, and Delia Jones, who's at the Texas Observer. She uh, writes a lot about culture. She's really great. I also just personally love her. So um, yeah, those are two. So I find that following people whose work I really admire um, and who also like follow good Twitter hygiene in terms of like not constantly retweeting just doom, right? Like that has been really helpful to me in terms of, you know, not, not doom scrolling, which is a good segue into our next question, which again, this is pretty utilitarian, but how do you as journalists find writing, like how do you use Twitter and find writing that you wanna read? news that you want to read without feeling like you're just constantly scrolling through all of this doom. So basically, how do you find the good stuff? I, I mean, I try to restrict like how many people I follow, uh, not have a huge, you know, like several thousand, because I feel like when I was doing that, it was some of that doom scrolling, just seeing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So I really try to uh, curate like who I'm following, who I'm not following and trying to get a mix of like sports, politics, culture, because um, it just keeps me in the loop on everything and like yeah, the really good writers out there. I'm, I'm gonna have like kind of a cheat answer to this and say, I don't go to Twitter for that. Um, right. You know, I, I used to like really enjoy reading people like I wrote Madison, like people who are really funny and care about the things I care about, um, you know, and like Chris L and, you know, Kid Fury, people like that. Like I, like that, they all are interested in the things I'm interested in. But then if I'm, if they're on my timeline, I'm getting all this crap too. I'm getting all the news as well because it's all kind of together because I have to use Twitter for work. So honestly, like my safe space, like the thing that I like, and it's just so weird about from me about like a weird thing about me is like, I really like YouTube. Like YouTube has like, you know, I can follow people who are like taking like, you know, vacations that I can't or who are giving me like Canadian girls giving me tips on how to make my apartment look better. You know what I mean? Like just like movie reviews for things that I'm thinking of watching. Like I find that because Twitter is work to me, like I'm trying to keep them separate so I don't mesh them. That's been like a life hack of the past year or so. Um, so yeah, that's like not really a real answer, but um, that's kind of like the move I have. Um, and I'm trying every day, not trying to get on TikTok. Because um, I know that'll be like even more fluff. In like no, Ashley, you're going to love it. I find that TikTok is an incredible, oh, it's so creative. It's so like, so generative. It's so deeply funny when it's good. Like I just, it, it feels different to me than basically any other social media that I consume. So I, I would actually strongly endorse TikTok. Um, I think that what you were saying before about how like Twitter is a workspace for you, one of the big causes of burnout that I um, try to talk about is how all of like our social life and our social media and work has blended for so many people. So like, if you have to do any sort of work with Facebook, like managing it in any sort of way for your business, or like if you have like any sort of brand or business that you work with that also has a social media account, then like any time that you log on to that, you are also doing work right? Like you are attentive to work things and that allows work to seep into all of these crevices in our lives that leads to burnout. Um, any other tips you guys have? Um, I tend, TikTok's amazing by the way, so <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, I just tend to like follow, I guess, the newsletters or even like seeing what other um, native journalists or people I follow tweet tweet, but um, or like seeing recommendations from my colleagues too on Slack. I mean, that's how I find the good stuff. I like hearing me. Yeah. Soraya, do you have any tricks? Oh, geez. Um, this is probably like the thing that I'm, I'm not very good at. <laughs> Um, you know, because like on the one hand, like there are folks who I know, like no matter what they write, like I'm instantly going to click like Angelica Jade Bastian is one of those people for me. Right. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, I, I do follow a ton of people. Um, fortunately, I will say um, like one of my favorites who I feel like will just, who always provides a laugh because she's absolutely ridiculous is um, at Written by Hannah, um, who is like, who is just willing to 
always throw out like just ridiculous takes, particularly when it comes to men who are unconventionally hot. Um, I, I have to say, I disagree with her about Joel Osteen, but to each their own. Uh, <laughs> who else? Um, yeah, cause, cause you, you know, sometimes you just need those people to throw in that sort of like light chaos grenade, um, <laughs> just into the time that has nothing to do with like anything important. Um, but you can still just sort of like work yourself into a lather about anyway. Oh, you know who else is really good at that? Hunter Harris, um, at New York Magazine. Um, yeah. And I, then like, oh, go yeah, oh, uh, oh, one more. Okay, I would say um, Blair, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting her last name right now, but she wrote Welcome to the Goddamn Ice Cube. And so she's always posting pictures of her wonderful uh, sled dogs. And they just have like these fantastic personalities. The other thing that I realized is that like I just love pe I love it when people post pictures of their babies now because I'm just like they make me feel hopeful for the future. I'm like we have to fix this shit. Do you see these cute children? Like come on, how how could we not? Like I feel that way about like Adam Serwer's kids and also his cats. <laughs> so those are yeah I I am actually like really appreciative of all of them for for giving us more than just doom. <laughs> Yeah, and I think they also insert humanity into the timeline, right? Like remind us yeah. that these aren't, like these are people, right? These are people with lives. Like they aren't just trolls in the sum of their, yeah. you know, like people that you were talking to on the internet are more than just a Twitter avatar. They are fleshed out people. Um, my one little hack is I use an app called Nuzzle that basically aggregates all of the things that people have tweeted in your feed. Um, so like if you look if like you open it up and it shows like, oh, 47 people that you follow tweeted this article. And then you can click on it and see what they tweeted about it. And what it does is it really um, relieves me of the feeling that like, oh, I missed, I missed the entire news cycle. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Right. So I can just open it up and be like, oh, here are the big stories that like the people that I follow whose opinion I value are all tweeting about. And then if you scroll down, then you get to the things that like, four people retweeted, right? And those are the things that oftentimes are really interesting because they're a little bit more niche. And so like, you know, a bunch of, like if it's some some sort of kind of like weird thing that Vulture published, right? Like a bunch of Vulture people will retweet it, but maybe it hasn't like, you know, maybe a hundred people that you follow haven't retweeted it, but it, you know, you can find it and figure out that it's interesting. Um, well, so the thing I wanted to say just generally about this panel is I'm so glad that you guys all came here. I am so suspicious of Zoom events and was like very nervous and also dubious. I was like, is, are people gonna show up? Like everyone's so tired of looking at screens. But you know, I, I've seen very few people <laughs> over the course of the last couple of months. And I, I forget sometimes that it is, it is such a generative experience to be with other people and have communication like this, even if it's virtual, like I can't wait to someday like all be in the same space together. But sometimes I think I talk myself out of going to things like Zoom events because I'm like, oh, it's gonna feel like whatever. You're like, it's not gonna be as good as the actual event but I wanna talk myself into more. And I hope everyone who is here tonight also feels that way. Um, so thank you all. And everyone, please check out all of the organizations that um, we've talked about tonight. I am so thrilled to be able to donate and support all of them. And um, please follow all of our panelists as well on their various social media where they will intermittently be for the rest of their careers. But um, I'm gonna throw it back to Julia of Politics and Prose and I can't thank Politics and Prose enough for hosting us tonight. Thank you, Anne. We here at Politics and Prose would sincerely like to thank you, Hamed Aliaziz, Jordan Vinette Begay, Ashley Lopez, and Soraya Nadia McDonald, and of course, our audience out there. 
Your patronage and dedication enabled us to continue to bring you PNP Live's amazing programming. And we wouldn't be able to host these kinds of events with these amazing discussions without your support and the book sales to support them. So please, if you haven't done so already, please follow the chat to purchase Anne Helen Peterson's Can't Even on all of these amazing writers provoking titles. Um, for more PNP Live, you can check out our website for update event listings and um, take your pick. It's going to be an exciting fall if we don't all burn out before then. Um, before we go, allow me to announce the winner of our sweatshirt giveaway. Congratulations, Catherine Addington. We're going to drop the email of the publisher into the chat so you can set up your shipping information with them. Congrats. Enjoy that capitalism is broken sweatshirt right in time for the chilly weather. Um, a final round of thanks to everyone here um, and to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, and from all of us at Politics and Prose, stay strong, stay safe, and stay well read. We will see you next time. <laughs>